feeding of werewolves. Episode 21, The Magical Marine World of Cox Bluestone. Where's James? Is he invisible again or not here today? Alex, get off the ceiling! And Darian, if you spill any of that blood pack on my carpet, you'll be slurping it up. Hey, hey, Lisa, look at me. Give me the meat cleaver. Where do you even get these? All right, great. You're all sitting down. Good job. All right, I was out a little too late for the full moon last night, so we're going to watch a video while I take a nap. Don't set anything or anyone on fire. Optical orbits up front if you got them. And remember, we keep our subesophageal ganglion to ourselves. <sighs> In the ocean, many things are hidden. Today, we are going to expose them. Hello, my name is Cox Blusto. Join me as we dive into an utter world. My first memories are of the ocean. Dreaming of what worlds lay below the sea ice. Not oceans as they are known in this realm. Today, we are exploring Puget Sound, where a tremendous and varied population of supernatural marine life forms an oasis amidst the bustling world of the humans above. This sprawling inlet was formed by vast ice sheets growing and shrinking time and again, much like adolescent this males. Is mine. 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 The only thing I've ever seen a harpy be so keen to keep is a, is a harpy fly. and siren fighting over a sea stack rock formation in an area with plenty of prey. Prior to World War II, islands rich in guano were praised and seized by the United States, forcing sirens and harpies further and further from their original Mediterranean habitat until they are now scattered across the world. They often compete for the same territory. Did you fly into too many glass doors as a child? This is mine. A siren's repertoire <laughs> of songs can incorporate those of cetaceans, allowing them to communicate with whales and dolphins. Your mother was a chicken and your father smelled of toe rag. There is some confusion in human lore that the siren is a mix of a nereid and a mermaid with the musical skills of the siren. Sirens and harpies are both women with the wings and legs of birds. Tear out your tongue. See a single fancy then you jumped up chicken. Was it you I hear whose father dear dropped anchor for a manatee? Despite the hopes of female attracted beings, sirens are more likely to eat them than to mate with them. Although, if they are lucky, they will get lucky before becoming dinner. She will then lay her eggs in a floating nest made of seaweed that she then releases into the ocean and will never see her babies again, rather like my own mother. 
I'll lay an egg on your head. The eggs are acidic enough to ruin La Sarine's beauty, which is usually enough to drive one off. But with prey so near, she is unlikely to give up her perch for her vanity alone. The harpy's claws are another defense that the siren lacks. Oh, watch the hair! You waddle and you fight like you have a belly ache. Maybe you should try not fighting on a full cloak. Harpies don't seduce. They torture into acquiescence by imprisoning their chosen mate until the deed is done and then they devour the male. Reminds me of an ex of mine. They lay their eggs in a nest constructed of the bones of their father in a twisted gingerbread man in a gingerbread house situation. Mother, who was my father? You're sitting in his carcass, dear. Now sleep tight. <laughs> I fucking hate you. Observe the harpy throwing her toxic fecal pap at La Sorine. It is poisonous to anyone but her babies. Luckily, my camera operator Pierre was in front of me and caught most of this splatter. Fortunately, his face cannot look any worse than it already does. Oh, the feathers are really flying now. Let's move on before I am caught in the crossfire. Silkies may dive up to eight times a day if they live close to the shoreline. They can live in salt water as well as fresh. This pod is taking a couple of pups for their first swim where they are kept safe within the center of the group. The pups watch their elders hunt, cooperating to disorient schools of Pacific Cod. This little one is curious and comes for a closer look. Hello, baby. An adult comes to collect him and warns me away with a strong slap of its tail. Selkies are rather boring because in seal form they're essentially seals and in human form they're human. Like seals, they may appear to be cute and clumsy on land but can mess you up. Do not recommend. Otherwise, they are harmless. Nereids are nymphs of the sea. No. Pierre, I said nymphs, not. Regardez, ceci le mer que j'ai enduré. <sighs> they are unsure of me, so I must move slowly without sudden gestures. They are gentle beings who farm seaweed, mollusks, and shellfish, using magic primarily to hide and protect themselves from outsiders. But beware angering them, for they can summon a furious storms and towering waves. As you can see, Nereids appear to be beautiful humanoids and are true mammals. Living close to the surface for their lung capacity is like the dolphins. Eight to ten minutes. Most merfolk sightings are actually nereids, although they lack the tails of their neighbors, for they live in the epipelagic zone, the uppermost layers of the ocean where there is much sunlight. Instead of tails, nereids have long webbed feet at the end of two legs and webbed hands like that of the merfolk. Unlike merfolk, nereids are mammals with a short, dense fur. So, to a land dweller, they must appear to be the same. Male folk live a little deeper in the twilight zone where the reds disappear from the visible spectrum as their longer wavelengths lack the energy to penetrate so deep. Pierre, you have the wit of a starfish. Yes, that is precisely my point. They have no brain. Yeah, I am nearing the dragon span wall. 
an artificial reef formed over the ancient body of an aquatic dragon that settled here after its death. Layers of corals fused together and encrust the skeleton, camouflaging its true nature from human divers with shapes alien to terrestrial eyes and attract food for the creatures living within and around it. From death springs a community bursting with life in the cold, dim, green water where these creatures are safe from detection. A tendril of sargassum, a carnivorous variant of seaweed, brushes against one of my tentacles to see if I will make a good meal. Not today, I think, for I am too large for it to digest. The blades are lined with nematocysts that pierce the fleshy bits and paralyze, much like a jellyfish. It is like a sea anemone and some kelp shared a bottle of tubok chok during Netflix and chill and uh, regrettable choices were made. However, they reproduce asexually, which is less fun, but on the other claw, much less hassle. The venom tingles, like when I sit on my tentacle and... <clears throat> It will then draw the meal towards the maw at the base of the plant, where it will slowly be digested alive. This is its only orifice and is used to eat, breathe, and poop. I'd rather not come back as a sargassum in my next life. Since you will be helpless once it gets its tentacles on you, your best recourse is to seek kelp or avoid it all together. Colorful anemones sway back and forth as I descend, using the swim bladder and gills I develop during my metamorphosis as a youth. In order to go deeper, it was necessary to adapt to my chosen environment. I wish to be independent, without the cumbersome bubble spells, suits, or temporary modifications that force a return to the surface. It is a privilege to be visiting such secretive beings here in their hidden home. There are many benefits to being a marine biologist. The inhabitants retreat into the artificial reef at night, emerging during the daylight hours when they are most active. They protect this reef from the damage inflicted by overfishing, pleasure boats, and other hazards posed by humans. A magical field filters out pollutants to create a haven. In order to get the proper population sample, we must use a little dynamite. Then we can collect a small percentage of bodies when they float to the surface and dissect them. The fish with inhaled swim bladders sink to the bottom where they will become food for scavengers. They are also very tasty. Oh, this one. This one is full of delicious eggs. Ah, the blood in the water has attracted an Atuska. Sounds like a sneeze. Are you sure that's how it's pronounced, Pierre? Each you sky? That sounds worse. Atuska. Atuska. Jim and Fish, we will fix in post-production, and by we, I mean you. The Akushka ak 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 is the fiercest of all the water horses, a genius in which they share with Kelpies, Hippocamps, and Glashtin.
Like its cousin, the Kelpie, the Akshushka is a shapeshifter and can appear as a horse, a large bird, or an attractive human. This last allows it to lure prey and lovers. The Kelpie has hooves, but the Akshushka has cartilaginous webbed appendages with four fingers. Helpful for a naturalist to know, but perhaps less useful when it's rushing towards you, as they both have very sharp teeth, makes counting fingers a little difficult. This one is using those very sharp teeth to tear into an arbor seal. The blood has attracted another act. It is wondering whether it is worth the fight for the tasty meal. Their sense of smell is so strong they will attack another of their kind if it smells of recent prey, confusing them for a potential source of food. This one thinks it is not a good idea and turns its sights on Pierre. Do not let it touch you, Pierre. When near water, they secrete slime, and not just because they are happy to see you, although they are. Anyone who touches them will become glued to this creature, who will race to the nearest sea or lock, where they will drown and then consume their victim, except for the liver, which is left for scavengers to glean. Zero out of ten. Do not recommend. Despite its size, it is quite fast and agile and has almost caught up with Pierre. Oh, that was a close one. Swim towards the camera, Pierre, so we can get a good shot of it up close. It is still possible to tame an Ashushka if you keep it far from water. Once it smells its home, it will remember its nature and like most people, it does not like to be kept bridled. No king shaming intended. It has the vulnerabilities of most fleshy things, especially hot water to the groin. Well, I assume when they're in human form, Pierre. No, I don't know how you would throw boiling water at a horse's... Yes, I know that a bird's beat are on the inside. I swear, I have had more scintillating conversation with a jellyfish and their mouth and their ass are the same orifice. <clears throat> Note how the area is free of debris and pollution. The merfolk and narrates are very fastidious in maintaining the ecological health of their environment. They must work constantly to keep the ravages of humans and other land dwellers at bay. The plastic they collect is pushed into a mass called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. No, Pierre, great as in huge, not that Something. There's something I never wish to know about you, and now I cannot unknow it. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a gear of floating trash and suspended particles twice the size of Texas. The merfolk, capable of swimming great distances, drops the garbage there as if to say, look at what you are doing, get your ship together. This may seem an incredible feat of cooperation between disparate populations spanning the largest ocean on earth, but they are interdependent on each other for survival. After all, no one is an island unto themselves. Working together, they can bring down beaked whales, which can grow up to nearly 13 meters in length, depending on the species. No. Pierre, you have to get my good side. The side with my face, of course. <sighs> you are lucky that you are the son of my cousin. 
here comes a formation at top speed, flaring their spiny dorsal fins in a show of aggression to warn us off. Not their harpoons, a weapon used against merfolk for centuries. Their bone and obsidian knives slice easily through the plastic nets of human fissures, allowing them to steal the harvest and free the rest. They will treat their weapons with a paste made from the venom of sea snakes. I have heard this adds a spicy note to the meat. Merfolk features appear alien to most beings on this human-dominated planet, certainly nothing like the imaginations of sailors, for they evolved separately from Homo sapiens and never needed to pass among them undetected. They have four freakishly long, creepy webbed fingers and vertical tails, not the horizontal ones of marine mammals. See the gills along the neck? This species has silvery, iridescent scales. Some can be brightly colored, black and red, and other combinations depending on environment. All varieties have delicate fins that allow them to swim gracefully or to embrace a mate. The binary sexes are blurred in merfolk. The largest and strongest change their sex to female, to better entice prey and protect the herd. If there are too few males, the smallest and weakest females will become male. Like the seahorse, the female will insert her ovipositor into a specialized sac on the male's belly, where she deposits up to four eggs and he will then fertilize them. Over several months, the eggs will gestate and hatch within the brood pouch. When ready to give birth, the males contract their abdomen, shooting babies in every direction. This merfolk is having a snack of prawn, beginning with the tail, the tastiest part. Oh, they are slipping it down like a noodle! The prawn's eyes rotates on its stalk to stare accusingly at me like I am some sort of pervert as it is being eaten. Like the nereids, merfolk will cultivate seaweed, mollusks, and other crops. Both species have been known to keep cephalopods, fish, and other animals as pets, following them around like little Pierre here does. Merfolk are vulnerable to the usual methods of death and dismemberment, but they are very fast and intelligent. You do not want to anger them. These ones seem rather crabby, as we are in their territory. Let us go deeper. We are entering the Midnight Zone, where killers lurk in the depths. My echo sounder pings off my surroundings, allowing me to navigate through the depths without relying on the bioluminescence of my esca. I like to use it to read at night and draw in specimens for closer inspection. The Kraken can grow over 100 feet long, although getting them to hold still long enough to measure all of its tentacles is quite difficult. Its thick and turbid poop is agreeable to the smell or taste, or perhaps both, of other fishes in the sea. Yes, I am quite certain. Fish is multiples of one species. Species refers to groups consisting of more than one species. I am not at all surprised you are so intimately familiar with the works of Dr. Seuss. Its poop emits a strong and peculiar scent due to a gland in its anus to beguile and lure in its prey. 
This gland also expels ink and mucus. Like smaller cephalopods, the kraken have chromatophores, color-changing cells that can be manipulated to camouflage and confuse. Each pigment-filled sac can project a mirror effect spell that scatters sonar so it can pass undetected. No, Pierre likes ships and whales and how would a bat even? A tiny submarine? To a spit, come a beads. There is no consensus on the best method of dispatching the Kraken, but as my mentor always said, when in doubt, set it on fire, which can be difficult if they are aquatic creatures unless you're Adele. Ah, now there is a siren. No, not literally. You just saw that sirens are feathered creatures of the air. That is is because the hairless apes that named them cannot tell the difference between a siren, narrate, and merfolk. Merfolk, like the ones we see now, are an abyssopelagic species with bioluminescent patterns to attract prey, communicate with each other, and flash brightly to confuse predators. Ow, yes, li like that. That hurt my eye stalks. They surround me. I have never seen so many before. They are swimming in a hunting formation. Their rows of sharp teeth and clawed webbed hands have evolved to create a most efficient predator. Ah, son of a bitch, that hurt! A single bite, and it's a signal to the others for the orgy to begin. Ow! 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 <laughs> The Magical Marine World of Cock Blusto was Blusto's last film and was finished posthumously by his family, who do not miss him, and know the multiverse is a better place without him in it. They hope this documentary will demonstrate the dangers of disrespecting nature, boundaries, and first cousins once removed. The Magical Marine World of Cock Blue Stow is brought to you in part by Captain Capers Chatter and Chum. Are ye exhausted from toiling away in the name of capitalism to perform a basic maintenance of a meat soup? Come on down to Captain Capers and get you a nice delicious bowl of our signature sea serpent stew. Looking for some surf and turf? We got roast monkfish. We offer contactless delivery, so you don't have to wear pants. Captain Capers, chowder and chum, we promise we're not Akshuska. What the fuck did I just watch? Thank you for listening. Today's episode was written by Brenna Anderson Dowd in collaboration with Frederick Elmore. Edited by Frederick Elmore. Music by Kevin Elmore. Featuring Frederick Elmore as Cox Bluestow and Captain Caper. Brenna Anderson Dowd as the Harpy and Announcer. Noelle Rose as the Siren. Rebecca Hansen of Be Not Afraid as the Teacher. And Taryn Baldwin as Addison. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend over some surf and turf. Find us on Facebook at Care and Feeding of Werewolves, tweet us at Care Werewolves, or email us at feedingwerewolves at gmail.com. Please rate and review. Care and Feeding of Werewolves is a podcast distributed by Kerfuffle and Chaos Productions and licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution share-alike 4.0 international. All content on the Care and Feeding of Werewolves podcast is fictional and for entertainment purposes only. Content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. 
Always seek the advice of your doctor or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of an episode. Reliance on any information provided by Care and Feeding of Werewolves, Griffuffle and Chaos Productions, or anyone involved with the production of this podcast is solely at your own risk. Remember, fish are friends, not food. Unless they're battered and fried, then they're delicious.